So uh, I'll just do a brief intro. I'm going to give you a, an overview of Engineers Without Borders as well as this El Benito water supply project, which is funded by a global grant with our funds primarily and a little dab from the Morning Club. And so I'm the lead for our club on this global grant. Um, in terms of uh, the project, at, with Engineers Without Borders, I'm a co-project manager. That's what that gobbledygook set of, uh, of, of, num of, of letters says for this project. And in terms of my background, I've been with EWB since 2005. So that's been a while now. And as I was just reminded, I've been a member of this Rotary Club since uh, 2014, so that's five years there. So let me go through this. There's a lot of slides and quite a few words, but we'll go through them fast. There's a lot of pictures, which I think are important. But I want to cover first what Engineers Without Borders USA is. And then I'm a member, it's kind of like Rotary. It has a headquarters, it has regions, it has clubs and so forth. But uh, my club is the San Francisco Professional Chapter. There are a lot of student chapters, so professional chapters are a little rarer. And then we'll give an overview of this Rotary Global Grant Funded Project, the El Lanito Water Pumping, Storage, and Distribution System for an Existing Well in El Lanito, Nicaragua. So first, what's EWB USA about? Well, the vision and mission are here. I think they're pretty hard to argue with. A world in which all communities have the capacity to meet their basic human needs. And then EWB supports community-driven development programs worldwide through the design and implementation of sustainable engineering projects while fostering responsible leadership. And that responsible leadership is both in the communities that they're working with as well as many of the young student or young professionals on the USA side. So that's the other component of that. In terms of uh, this organization, it was started in uh, 2000 with eight members, one chapter, and one project, and now in 2019 it's almost 14,000 members, 300 <coughs> chapters, 700 plus programs in 44 countries with greater than two and a half million lives impacted. Uh, the San Francisco Professional was the first professional chapter that was chartered. <coughs> Established in 2004, about 200 active members seven infrastructure and one appropriate technology uh, design team project. I'll touch on that in a bit. And they're exploring initiation of a community engineering core uh, project, which is in the US. Uh, they have an executive council and support committees that provide chapter management, fundraising, and publicity. And I'll be there tomorrow night for our annual fundraising gala. So in terms of the portfolio of projects that the chapter has, this is representative. This is the current snapshot. We've got. Uh, these ones that are listed here, and you can see the countries and the scope, the, just a brief statement of the kinds of projects. The Kenya Water Supply, Fiji Water Supply and Sanitation, Haiti Community Health <coughs> Clinic, Solar Power, Bridges, Honduras Water Distribution. Uh, one, there are two teams working in Nicaragua, El Limon, who's working on composting latrines and a water distribution solar pump, and the one that I'm involved in, which is the water supply for El Limito. Also, we've used a global grant funded uh, vehicle for, uh, this, from this club and others to do composting latrines in Nicaragua through this appropriate technology design team. And the newest team in the chapter, Ethiopia, uh, is working on latrines and hand wash washing stations, monsoon water management, clinic and school upgrade and expansion. So that just gives you a taste of the kinds of projects that flow through there. Now in terms of the process and the, the commitment, EWB programs have they have a non-governmental organization, an NGO in shorthand, and a community-based organization, a CBO, which act as a liaison to the community. And basically there are three project phases. You do an assessment, you do design and implementation, and then you monitor and evaluate this project. And these, these international programs typically have a five-year minimum commitment to the community, and often what happens, you do the first project, and then you're monitoring that, and then the second project pops up and so forth. So the Haiti project I mentioned, that was active when I came into the chapter in 2005 and it's still kicking, although EWB is now phasing out some countries uh, and Haiti will not be, they will not be taking on new projects there. The service core and appropriate technology projects vary in length depending on the, the needs of the NGO and the community. This community engineering core, and this slide is one of Alan's favorites, it has so many words on it, but the brief is, this is an opportunity for EWB teams to work in the U.S. Basically, they partner with organizations and, and communities that can't really access conventional architectural engineering services. They put those things together. 
they provide pro bono engineering for it, they don't raise money for it, and they don't build it. That's one of the key differences. And we're uh, actively exploring initiating one of those projects, or more, in, in the San Francisco chapter. And then I really wanted to give you an update on this project, and towards the end I'll share some late-breaking news about it, but this is the one that, that our club's global grant is, is, is funding. This is a view from above the community, looking down on El Lanito. It's about, um, let's see, do I have... This is a community of about 300 households, about 1,100 people. And this is the background on how this project was, was identified and how we got to where we are now. In 2014, the NGO we work with, Alcanza Nicaragua, identified this project with me. I was there doing composting latrines on a visit there. And we identified this little uh, hand pump well in the community of El Lanito. Uh, we talked about it. There are nearby hills, high places where you could put a storage tank. Power is very close by. So you could envision throwing a submersible in here and pumping it up to the hill and gravity feeding it out into the community. So mostly women and girls don't have to walk as far to haul water. You know, water of pints of pounds. So if you've got five gallons of water on your head or your shoulder, this is a pretty heavy load and they do this day in and out. And so we scoped the project. We got it a, a basically approved by EWB in 2016 in the spring. Late uh, in 16, we did this assessment trip that I'll describe. We got approved for that, and then we're, we got our alternatives analysis approved. They have a very formal process for delivering these projects, but we'll walk through that and where we are now. So again, a, a bunch of words, but here's the clientele primarily for this community. These are the women and girls mostly who are using this well. And we're delivering a project in which we try to improve public and environmental health through provision, provision of a reliable, high-quality source of potable water by the electric pump and storage system. We also aim to positively influence changes in behavior by improving and supporting access to services, technical knowledge related to projects, community organization, and community self-advocacy. And then there are more expected results here. This is part of a formality that you have to write this stuff down for EWB. Greater community access to high-quality water, in terms of economics, reduced time investment in water gathering, less work time loss to illness when you get bad water. Public health, that improved public health for the community. Behavior, you know, an opportunity for more community interaction around the water distribution location and more time available for other activities. And then the kind of growth in technical knowledge and sustainability that comes with doing these kinds of projects together as a community. The key objectives when we went to do this assessment were to check out uh, the well, make sure it was worth investing in, so we actually performed a pumping test, look for storage tank locations and, and dial those in, look at the pipe routing for this distribution system, and then look at the soil, the groundwater, the hydrology, <coughs> the topographic data for this community, and then in terms of construction equipment, materials availability and transportation. And this is just a list of the people who made that trip. And then our team has been augmented now by more San Francisco members. We've got more UC Berkeley student chapter members involved in this project with major deliverables that they're providing for it. And then we, uh, kind of as an odd thing, uh, we had support from V3 and Williams Creek Engineering in Chicago who sought us out and said, can we help? And so they did. They really uh, worked uh, a lot with our student team in particular bringing along the design. In terms of where this is, if you look down lake, below Lake Managua there, you can see the International Airport. It's about a two and a half, two hour or so drive, uh, 90 kilometers up that highway to get up to Santa Lucia, which is just a walk away from El Lanito. It's just an adjoining community. And this just shows on a GPS kind of a view in Google Earth, that red uh, marker is where the well is, and then the community down to the southeast, Santa Lucia, uh, uses this well, has used this well during droughts because it's that good at performing little well when the water system in that larger municipality isn't cut in. So our assessment trip results, which is basically you report back to EWD USA, is this a go or a no-go kind of a thing? That's what you're supposed to come away from. Definitely a go. Uh, we were able to sustain long-term pumping rates up to 20 to 30 GPM. The water was a good quality with based on our sampling results. The land survey confirmed that nearly all the homes are below the proposed tank site, and the community is very engaged with the project and eager to make a difference. So we hired this local surveyor who shot a total station survey of the entire El Benito community. That included the well site, uh, potential pipeline routes through the community, existing roadways, footpaths, routes to the community proposed location for a water storage tank, and this proposed tank location can serve all but the highest houses via a gravity-fed pump distribution system. 
And these survey data, we're using them actively to do the design of the distribution system. We did this well pumping test. Again, we hired a local contractor who came in. He pulled the hand pump well. You can see the downhole end of that hand pump. This is a classic uh, uh, rope bicycle wheel kind of a hand pump that's used throughout Central America. That was pulled out. Uh, he's got a level meter where he's checking the water level in here. He threw in a, a temporary electric pump powered by his own generator set, and, and we pumped this 100-foot uh, well and had a starting level of the water, and we pumped it up to 33 GPM for five-plus hours, followed by a two-hour recovery. So his generator said, crapped out, so we were going to go for eight hours. <laughs> at that point, his generator stopped, and what are you going to do? By the end of the pumping, we had oh, greater than 10,000 gallons of water had been wow. discharged, resulting in 20 feet of drawdown. We demonstrated the well is capable of pumping at rates between 20 and 30 GPM for up to 10 hours a day. And the data, we're using that data to do our design, our sizing, and storage tank capacity, and so forth. And then we were able to grab a, a sample and take it to uh, the National Engineering Laboratory and have it tested for water quality. Uh, including uh, coliform, pH, turbidity, hardness, and selected metals and anions, and the results were good. Uh, it's not contaminated by human or animal waste. The concentrations were well below the Nicaraguan standards for all the parameters, with two exceptions. There was some total coliform present, but that's not a problem in terms of human health. And the electrical conductivity is above the recommended levels, but that's just an aesthetic thing. And this community has been using this water for a long time, so that's not a problem. Here's just, I thought, an ingenious guy filling up his container, topping it off with a plastic bag in terms of how he collects his water. Uh, the community is very engaged. This is the community center. Uh, our, our travel team's in the front row. I'm on the far right there. We conducted these formal Engineers Without Borders uh, community and NGO meetings, both on arrival, when we reviewed our trip objectives and sought community input and addressed questions. And then on completion, we reported out and summarized the results and laid out the next steps. Part of this is you have to manage expectations carefully, you know, and, and not, not have people think you're going to come back tomorrow with a solution. Uh, our NGO partner, Alcanza Nicaragua, has been invaluable. They are first-rate community organizers. Uh, they've served as that liaison to the community. The lady in orange, Luz Dania, lives nearby. Several of the other community, uh, the NGO members, live in this and work in this community. They collected population density uh, uh, data by area. They assisted with the design of the water distribution uh, locations and the pipe routing. They aided with potential locations for additional water tanks where we need them. Um, the observations, again, I, every time I see these young women, mostly and girls, hauling this water, it reminds me why I like this project so much. But, but what we did is we billeted our group amongst households in the community. So we observed how they used water, and we used it the same way. Uh, we asked the hosts and others in the community about their water use needs and practices, and we're using that information in our design. And then also, EWB has this uh, acronym called Project Managing, Management, uh, Planning, Management, Evaluation, and Learning. Some of us are used to these sort of circles like continuous improvement. They, they expect you to take data to go through that process, and so that supports that process for EWB. So the conclusions were that it's a, a viable project and worth continuing. The, topic, the topo results were that you can see these elevations for the, uh, this is where the proposed uh, tanks would be. Uh, between that and the well pad elevation, we've got about almost 100 feet of head to work with. Our pumping test showed we can pump this at very, uh, very good rates. And uh, when we see a maximum water level drawdown at that pump inlet of maybe 95 feet, we've got around 200 heat feet of elevation delta up to the tank, uh, the friction head losses and so forth. So this is normally about a 280 foot head kind of a loss, to, and we're refining that clearly when we're going through our engineering evaluation and design. This was the first preliminary layout of this pipeline distribution system through the community. It's normally about three and a half kilometers worth of pipe to get this stuff routed around. It doesn't get plumbed into every home. It gets plumbed into tap stands distributed throughout the community. So every household has got a much shorter to walk to get the water. And uh, this is the team at the community center uh, on our way out. Uh, the, the welcome green, the super green goes above the door there. It wasn't for us, but we didn't mind. We sort of claimed the title anyway. And so there we go. <laughs> uh, all kinds of team members and uh, on our way heading for the airport. And here's the current status of this project. 
Uh, and some of you are aware Nicaragua, since last April, has had a lot of political instability and crisis mode. So for a time, EWB had a travel suspension, viewing it as not prudent to have uh, travelers under their aegis going in and out of Nicaragua. But that's been lifted in late June. And so now we're working with the, it turns out EWB has two project offices in Nicaragua, staffed by Nicaraguans. We're working with them on uh, arranging the travel and procurements and so forth, but planning to travel ourselves rather than using remote implementation, which would have made this a more difficult project to do completely long distance. We're, we're darn near ne there with our, our design completion and getting all the deliverables required for this formal process, so we'll have to submit an implementation pre-trip plan. We're getting our cost estimates updated. Uh, the engineering team in Chicago and others now locally are engaged in being our Berkeley team uh, on, on completing the deliverables. Uh, our NGO, Alcanza Nicaragua, has done a yeoman's job here of facilitating community meetings for us to discuss the alternatives and the priorities, and they've led actions towards formulation and legal recognition of the community water system, the CAPS, and I'll explain more about that in a moment. In terms of fundraising, as I mentioned, we have a major chunk of funds from our club. The global grant provides 35.6K worth of funds for construction. It's got another K or two for project management and <coughs> monitoring and evaluation. And we had uh, an award from our internal chapter grant last season of four and a half K, and we're applying again. So um, we'll probably boost our EWB funds up to about 15K available to apply to this. And we have some other fundraisers coming up if we need them. In 2018, these community meetings unfolded. This again is that community center that I showed you with the community meeting to the, consider alternatives. And the thing about CAPS is really important, and, and I'll get to this, but in Nicaragua, most of these water systems are managed by a formal entity recognized by the Nicaraguan government called the Committee de Agua Potable y Sanamiento, which is the Potable Water and Sanitation Committee, or CAPS. And getting that status is a big deal because then you can be exempt from taxes, you can charge tariffs, you can enter into um, uh, contract for services and <coughs> land titles. So this is a real important step to get to. And in February of 2018, Alcanza did a community meeting where over 200 people attended and the board members were elected for that committee. They presented their constitution to the mayor's office and obtained municipal status and then went to the next step. The mayor was supportive. They moved for full central government legal status. Just to give you an idea of the sense of engagement of this community, that's that community center again, chock full of people who were there for this CAPS meeting. They really have skin in the game. They want this to happen really bad. There's the people who are running for this and have been selected to be their officers for the CAPS. There they are in the mayor's office uh, where they presented their constitution to that office and got their support. And here they are in August of 2018, legalized as one of these, these CAPS uh, with formal standing issued by this water committee, the Nicaraguan Institute of Aqueducts and Sewer. Uh, in 2019, some of the things that have happened is that Engineers Without Borders Nicaragua office came up to El Nito and piloted their CAPS training workshops with the community, with Alcanza Nicaragua, with our local Rotary partners in Nicaragua, and uh, the rest of the community. Um, this, uh, the woman to the, the left here in the black top is Martha Castillo Cohn. She's the lead on this project from the Messiah Rotary Club, uh, which is about 20 minutes south of, uh, of Managua. She visited the community during this, this training workshop. And uh, basically where we're at now is, well, we need to just wrap up our preliminary design for this, this pre-trip plan, submit it for approval to implement, then go ahead and implement by travel, uh, rather than using the road implementation thing, and then continue to do the monitoring. And the breaking news on this is that uh, on Sunday, we met with our Berkeley student team and the uh, uh, Luz Dania from NG, the, the NGO and two members of the CAPS board uh, joined us by a Zoom call. And we're, we're, we subsequently met on Monday by Zoom with the project engineer in the Nicaragua office for EWB USA. And so we think that shortly after uh, December, after Christmas in December, we may be able to proceed with early imp implementation activities and get some of the early long lead items. For example, to get power taken to this site, to the well, you have to get approval from the utility to do that, and one of the things we've identified is that the inspection cr crew that they want to have do it, a fire department from the nearby municipality of Boaco, to come out and inspect things, and they want to see a little pump house there. So we have to break through, get a little pump house built, and have that ready for them to sign off to bring the electrical utilities to that. So 
The plan is to do that uh, in a two-week visit uh, time with the Berkeley students uh, uh, winter break, uh, and then come back in March having done training for, in addition to this pump house, training people on how to trench, how to install the PVC piping, how to build the first of the pressure break tanks that we need to do and line them out so that we can, we can have them continue a pace until we come back probably in the March time frame to wrap this thing up. So that's the story on this thing, and I'm happy to entertain uh, questions about it, and I want to thank every Rotarian who donates to the, the Rotary Foundation, to the World Fund, because this is an example of your dollars coming back to do good work at the World What's the total proposed cost of this project? What is the total proposed cost of this project? To be, to be determined. We're, we think we're going to be in the... 40 to 45k range, but we're still refining, if you will, our cost estimates based on updated bills of materials. When we scoped the global grant, we used an old study, an old bills of materials takeoff, and that's the sizing for the global grant. Plus, it was limited by how much DDF we had. Dale. Pat, two questions, one specific to this project and a, a global one. Uh, first of all, what are some of the deliverables that you're counting on the Berkeley students to come up with? Uh, they're working with a, a mentor to actually perform, to design the little pump house, so that'll be a slab and a reinforced concrete building with construction, typically with concrete masonry units reinforced, um, a corrugated metal roof. They've been involved in producing the, uh, the actual CAD drawings associated with the, uh, the, the piping distribution system under the guidance of a mentor. Um, there will be other elements like that, Dale. Terrific. A more global question. Does this project serve as a bit of a model for other villages and towns in the area or elsewhere in Nicaragua and perhaps other countries? It's not the only one. It turns out EWB has the most projects in Nicaragua as any other country. So there are other water supply projects. This is not groundbreaking, but on the other hand, it's a very nice example. Uh, and so it will get the attention of nearby communities and people People want these kinds of resources. So yes. Thank you. David's got a question, I think, over here. Oh. Uh, Pat, you had mentioned that EWB was going to not do any additional projects in Haiti. What leads to that kind of a decision? Uh, it's, a, it's a combination of two things, as near as I can uh, read it, uh, David. The, the short answer is that when you look at their tiers, tiered grouping of countries, for example, in tier four, you have places like Haiti and Honduras. You also have Belize. Now, Belize is not in any way a, a, a problem in terms of safety and security like Haiti or Honduras are. In the case of Belize, they view, they view that country as having reached a level of development maturity that EWB, that is not a priority for EWB to help them. In the case of some other countries, arguably they have not, but that the safety and security considerations of working in those countries give EWB USA enough heartburn that they would prefer not to make that a priority. So that's the simple answer. There's more to that as well. Uh, Hank? As, as the community grows and, and houses are placed near the well or near the aquifer in some way, uh, will there be a problem with contamination? It's a good question. Uh, there are a two-part answer to that. One, uh, we have worked closely with the community to make sure there are no existing or legacy, if you will, outhouses that, that, if we, that are right near our pipeline, because we'd not like to have that. And they're not right near the well itself, where you've got that much potential for groundwater. This is a community where we've done three rounds of composting latrines. And if we're, we have an application in with Pleasanton North for our Area 4, to see if we can do more composting latrines, in which case more would be done there. And those composting latrines are very important because they keep all that waste material and potential for contamination out of the groundwater, out of the soil where it can get into the groundwater. Uh, the other thing is that the population in this particular community is not going to grow a lot. We probe that really hard because, frankly, this well is limited in its capacity. You couldn't serve three times the population of this community adequately with this well. We think we'll just be able to squeak by and get them better than what they have now, but they're going to have to manage that carefully. So that goes to more of the growth issue and component, addressing the demand side for water, but also addressing the other issue you raised, which is the potential for more 
contaminants coming into the, the zone of influence. More questions? Jacob. Yeah, uh, a couple. Uh, where do you source the materials? So when you think about the pipes and all of that, where is that coming from? And then second, what's the longevity of this? So, you know, you build sure. this system, you put it together. It's an what, excellent 20, question, Jacob. The, the EWB, like Rotary, puts a huge premium on sustainability of these projects. The world's littered with well-intentioned people who came in and dropped a solution and the community couldn't maintain it. All these materials are sourced locally. Uh, locally, maybe from a local hardware store, they are more likely from the major municipality of Boaco, which is about half an hour away, failing that Managua, which is the big center where, I mean, frankly, you can get anything. And, and, and when we did the composting latrines, rebar, cement, CMUs, Piedras Canteras, the local quarry stone, uh, pea gravel, sand, those kinds of things were hauled <coughs> up by the truckload and placed in the community. So that's the approach there. And likewise, on our well, uh, uh, pump situation, we'll be working with local vendors there. Now, EWB has a policy, you have to source it all locally. Uh, the point in, in Managua at this point is you can get you can get a distributor who can get anything for you. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing I would say is that the, there's a EWB's <coughs> expectation on this is they're hard graders. 100% of the M&O costs for this are on the community. We don't come back and subsidize it. Further, and this is actually kind of, you have to finesse it with, with the Rotary Foundation because global grants say they can't have paid anything to get a project. EWB insists that they pay 5% of the capital costs. Now that sounds brutal for these poor communities. The experience in the development community is that makes all the difference in how a, a, a group and a community treats the project that goes in. The skin in the game. Basically. Yeah, yeah. How long does it cost? The longevity of the project? Uh, Design longevity? You know, it'll, it's it's going to be a PVC pipe distribution system, so there'll be inevitable repair. Um, the pump at some point is going to need to be replaced. Components will be replaced, but you could envision this being you could you could call it 30 years. You could call it it'll it'll be there for the long haul. You just keep keep rebuilding it, keep working on it. Any other questions? I will, Brian. Um, I was just wondering about the disaster the situation. You said it's. Uh, uh, powered by the electric distribution. Oh, sorry. So uh, the basic power is from the electric distribution. What happens when that goes out? Um, how long can you supply we've, we've water? We've explored that because this is kind of a, when you cut over, we don't have the hand pump option anymore in this well. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the outages <coughs> typically in El Lanito are on, are on the order of a few hours. Uh, in Central America, I think in the last week or two, they had a major outage that swept through Nicaragua, Salvador, a number of those countries that may have had them off the air for, for longer than that. In that case, people would be stuck. They'd be drawing on the water that's up in the tanks, the storage tanks, which may not be adequate, which you may run out of pretty quickly. Or they also, depending on the time of year, have been caching water from their rainwater catchment. Almost every household catches water and has drums in their yard and so forth. So it's not a completely satisfactory answer, but we're not planning to install a you know a backup generator for this that sort of thing. Right. Okay. Okay. Question from know. Kathy. Actually, it's more it's more like a reminder because you've given us a report on this before. But one of the things that um, I know you have a photo of this. But when they did the pump test to see how well the well would do. The people were there to collect the water that was coming out of the well. It wasn't just going into the ground because they did not want to waste the water. And that spoke volumes to me when I saw that because that's how important the water is to them. That's a great and so point. So I just Kathy. wanted to. Most of that 10,000 gallons that was pumped was collected and taken back to these local household storage barrels and so forth because they didn't want to see it wasted. But Another question, Randy, yeah. and then Mike. Solar power is an for this? We, we looked at solar and it's one of our alternatives. Solar is, uh, is tricky. You have to have solar and grid. You can't do it all with solar and it's capitally cost uh, uh, prohibitive for us. Is there a not to preclude at some point that you could see your way to solar? Maybe. We're not going to preclude that option, but they, they were very interested in it, but it, it adds a huge cost increment to the, the initial capital cost and you still have to have uh, you know, grid power. You can't do it all with solar. And a question over here from Mike. Uh, you know, I may have missed this, uh, Pat, but are there various distribution points 
uh, or you know where they go to collect the water? Is yeah, I didn't get, get into the details, Mike. There would be around 50 uh, what are called tap stands that would look for all. It looked like a little concrete pillar okay. that comes up with a faucet. So on it. people wouldn't have to go too far. Too. Right, right, and those will be distributed all along that three and a half kilometer pipeline. Thanks. I'm out of time. The the hook is out. I appreciate Thank you, Pat. Your generosity. <laughs>